Wrong back rug. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, one and all. Thank you for joining me on tonight for the Thursday Agenda. Um, tonight, we are, as no surprise, we have an agenda which involves some discussion on the budget. But before we get into it, could I invite you or ask each, of you, each and every one of you to share the link to those that you think might be interested to the persons that might want to watch and join us and engage in um, our discussions. We are, of course, on NTN Television. We are on Facebook Live, um, on the pages, my page, um, Sanjeev Daffodin, the MP page, my personal page, the Vice President's page, the PPP's page, um, quite a few of my colleagues' page. So if you are joining us on Facebook, um, I invite you to share the link to others and share it to your friends and colleagues who might be interested in what we have to say. Um, tonight, before we get started, as usual, I want to say good night to my little son, Sawyer, who is still up. Hi, Daddy loves you, and it's time to go to bed now. You should be going to bed. Um, so, on our agenda is a very simple, this week, very simple topic, Budget 2023. And I'll do my very best to offer to you uh, some insight into the budget and some insight as to the effect and what is its, its aims and, and, and where it's going uh, and where it's hoping to take us this year. Um, of course, we all know, start at the very beginning, the budget is the largest budget in Guyana's history. It's a 41% increase on last year's budget and it is 781.9 billion. Guyana dollars. Now, this is our first budget where we have substantial uh, amounts that are allocated from the National Resource Fund and from our the sale of Guyana's carbon credits. These amounts have come into the budget. Now, understand what a budget does and what this budget does. And if I say so, and I'll explain in detail why, it does an excellent job of addressing the needs that we have today and putting important or allocating funds to important infrastructure projects that are gonna take us well into the future. So, Remember when you have a budget, it's like your own personal finances at home. You have a budget. You have to spend some of it and some of your money. You have to balance how you spend it. You want to spend some of the money on building a home and improving your home, while at the same time you have to spend some of the money on your immediate needs, um, your electricity bills, your water bills, food. You have to be able to do this. Similarly, a responsible government is going to approach the funds that it has available and allocate those funds to both issues, meeting needs in some regards of what we have today, while 
putting the infrastructure in place for the future. Now there are several uh, advantages to that which we will get into in a little bit. But I want you to understand that this budget of 781.9, billion dollars, was done without any new taxes. And there has been no increase in any tax. There has been no introduction of a new tax. There has been no introduction, whether through the back door or by the side wind, there has been no increase in taxes. And that is a remarkable feat to move a budget by 40%, increase it by 40% without any new taxes. So the first advantage that every citizen has is quite simply this. They don't have to pay any new taxes. So there is no further charge on their hard-earned income by the state. The state is not trying to take any more. In fact, the state is trying to do the exact opposite. So. For example, we have to look as to how are we, how does the budget try to help people? But you see, I want to I wanna say to you, uh, comrades, ladies and gentlemen, we have to look at things in total. And we have to appreciate that some projects which we are spending money on now, we won't have to spend that money again because those projects are for long term. So for example, the, there is more than 150 million on the quarantine highway from Palmyra to Molson Creek. So they're going, there's going to be a four lane highway. We know that, there's, that the government has put out an invited uh, request for proposals for persons who are interested in a refinery. We know that the persons who are interested in a port, these are all going in the Palmyra area. Um, so there's, there's substantial economic activity going there. And the, the requirements and the needs of, uh, in, in that area for better roads, wider roads, there's housing going on in Palmyra. Some of the Gaisuko lands are going to be used for housing. As a result of which, you're going to have, or you're going to need more roads, you're going to need better roads, you're going to need highways, double lanes, uh, four lanes and all. You would need that. Now, once you've built that and you've spent that money, it's only an issue of maintenance for many years into the future. So if you look at the, the $700 billion budget and you look at as some of the major capital projects. So there is the highway, there is the highway, uh, there is a, the Suez Dyke Highway is also being addressed. There is the, um, the Ogle Highway to Diamond. There is, those highways are all high, substantial expenditure on roads. Then we have money being spent on the gas to energy project and that is nearly 150 million billion dollars uh, from that we're going to get cheaper electricity again once we've spent to install that um, that power station and we've done the work to bring the gas to shore so that it goes to the power station that wouldn't have to be a recurring expense there would only be maintenance required for that so that big expense now in next year's budget for example there's room for that money to be allocated elsewhere for other things similarly the bridge the demerara river bridge that's going to be built that's also about 200 million and again that is being paid for so again you have that that allocation so there are massive capital allocations that are being made in this budget that are not going to be recurring. 
these are this is like buying a house you buy a house once in your, well most people most families will buy a house once in their life it's usually the largest expense and then all the other expenses are just peripheral to it so these major infrastructural works that we're doing is to fund and to assist development way into the future when you build highways as we all know when you build a highway all of the lands are all open up all of those lands could now be used for industrial commercial residential purposes right now in Guyana with the demand for property property prices are going up a bit so and they're very high but if we want to be able to address that we have to have more lands available so by building these highways the ogle to diamond uh, roads the the new high, highway which we have mandela to to eccles you see every day you drive on that road you see the development happening on both sides of the highway the lands are opening up so as a result of that these are infrastructure work that is not by spent by the government spending to develop the road they're not only developing the road they're developing all of the surrounding lands they're making lands available to people who want to do business industrial commercial and for people to live residential this is how it would work right because major investment is required i i say every time and i say again guyana is guyana is not a rich country we have to understand that we are a country with great resources now we have an opportunity to take guyana from a very poor country from a poor country that was struggling into a country where its citizens are more comfortable but as a result the reality of that is our road network is deficient and we have to spend a lot of money to make the road network better electricity in guyana is the highest in this part of the world we spend so much more on electricity because we need to uh, the we need cheaper electricity if we are to develop if we are going to go down a part of development i mean simple thing and obvious thing is manufacturing but that's not all that is required people want more in their house people want air conditioning people want to be able to afford it so for that the electricity the promise of the the ppp government and his excellency uh, the president has said repeatedly that with this gas to energy project with this new power station that's going to be using gas the electricity price in the country is likely to go down by half now think of what that expenditure that is being done for the gas to shore project and the power station think of what benefit it will bring it doesn't only bring the development with it it brings that is along the pathway of it it doesn't only do that what it does it is now provides energy across the board so all of the businesses all of the residential they save money which makes cost of production for industrial and business and commercial uses goes down so you have to understand if you look at it holistically what the aims are we need these major infrastructure projects to be done now so that we are we are earning now we get the major infrastructure projects done so that the development that follows the 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 highway that is being built the road that is being built from linden to mabura that is in process the continuation of that is also included in the budget so the road network of guyana will get to the point where it will open up a lot of lands and it will allow for development because you can't expect that people will build 
their offices and their factories and their warehouses where there's no road. There's a lot of land. We all know that about Guyana, but it has to be accessible land. So that is one of the objectives that, that, that is being done. Spending on major capital projects so that the development of Guyana moves forward. Now, those things, because we require so much infrastructure in Guyana, that costs substantial money. And in this budget, you can see uh, $150 billion in roads in Bur Palmyra to Molson Creek, the river bridge, the power station. That alone takes up nearly $600 billion, $500 billion. So that's where the capital monies go. But I know that what people want to, to know is, is, how is it make, how is it in an effort to make them better? Now, simple things would be more than three billion was spent uh, is being spent for benefiting healthcare workers, salaries, 5,000 healthcare workers, and 9,000 members of the disciplined uh, forces. This is something that, so those people, as you know, knew um, last year, and we dealt with it, they got salary increases. Now, so more than $3 billion had to go towards that. It's going to continue this year, of course. The income tax threshold. Now, before it was, uh, if you earned 75000 dollars or less per month you didn't pay taxes so that was the the threshold under which you are now it's moved up to eighty five thousand dollars so there's a little bit more of a relief in taxes that will cost 3.3 billion dollars to the government the you, you remember that the the government the ppp government reintroduced where APNU had stopped it, the, the cash grants, the Because We Care cash grants. That has also increased from 25000 to 35000 Again, trying to make uh, a contribution to each child. Uh, and remember, in addition to that, there's the other 5000 which they receive for um, their uniforms. That's going to cost, this will, that will benefit nearly 215,000 students, and it of course will cost the government some money, more than $2 billion. How are we trying to reduce what goes on? In a world where there is hyperinflation, everywhere there is inflation, the pandemic costs is partly responsible, freight costs with ship shippers are up, and they're very expensive. Then we have the other side where supply chains are not being met. Goods are more expensive. So inflation is worldwide ongoing. And most, a lot of economies, a lot of the very large economies are actually contracting. They're going less. But you've got to understand this. Containing the zero excise taxes on fuel. So the government is trying to keep the fuel prices where it is. Uh, reduction on freight charges. You know that was introduced last year and that is going to continue this year. And a very important project where what you see across Guyana that's going to cost the government more than $10 billion is the part-time jobs. So part-time jobs are there to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to earn. So the, uh, um, the, the process, I believe, is you, you get part-time jobs for 10 days. You have to work 10 days a month and you get a minimum of $40,000. And the government takes you on to do various jobs and various, so that at least you have some source of income. The end result would be, ladies and gentlemen, as long as you want a job and you want to earn, there's an opportunity for you, whether it is from the regular um, service sectors, the regular job, or a part-time job. 
And then the government is putting more than a billion dollars into the gold scholarship program so that more people can get educated. And the, the aim, the aim of the budget, as you would have seen the trend, the trend is to try to get the, the, the expect, pay for the things that are going to be infrastructure that needs to move forward so that all development moves with it. Then try to give relief measures at various levels, make sure that taxes are not increased, and you give relief in, in small measure, but in meaningful measure, all across the board to reach every person. The uh, medical workers, the disciplined services, um, try, pensioners have gotten an increase, the children because you care crash grant. So in every sector, the um, assistance, public assistance for differently abled people has also increased. So the public assistance programs are going to meet the needs and try to leave, assist everybody across the board. You see, this is what this is what the budget is about. And this is what we have to understand as Guyanese. When th this is like when you are at home and you have to run your, the finances in your house. You, you've got to be able to pay or to, to live within your means. You can only pay what you can earn. You can only pay what you can do. You can't go beyond your means because then you'd find yourself in difficulties. But the government is, is trying its best to, to have public assistance. Um, there, there's several things. The, the, the mortgage ceilings has come down. And I don't want to make it too technical, largely because I'm not an economist and, and might have difficulty explaining it in detail to you. But you have to look at the budget as a whole, holistically, and see in the budget there are projects that you know are going to make your lives better the infrastructure project. Roads are going to make everybody's lives better. We, do, we spend, if you think about it, you spend so much time, if you spend an hour on the road now, that's one manpower hour. That's an hour of your day. So an hour to go, an hour to come home. That's two hours of your day. If you, that's wasted manpower hours. If, for example, you could do that with better roads in half the time, it means you have the rest of time. So every day you have an extra hour to do something. Spend with your family. Engage in commercial activities. Uh, relax. But, but you, you do understand why that having more time is invaluable. It's impossible if you have to keep spending all your time in transportation. It's getting more time is an unbelievable boon in your life. And this is what better infrastructure will achieve for you. But at the same time, there are measures that are there to try to alleviate the hardships and then try to alleviate what, what, what there is in terms of the various strata and segments of society. I mean, it's easy to criticize, right? It's easy for you to criticize and say, well, oh, you should have done this or you should have done that. But you have to understand if the government is to take the monies and spend it on not capital projects that will last forever, but handouts now, those handouts are going to be done and there would be no corresponding improvement in, in people's livelihoods. And there would be no corresponding movement in the quality of life because there's no infrastructure to support it. So you understand why there have to be a balance. We are a poor country. We're going to have to spend a lot on infrastructure while at the same time trying to cushion the effects and to make the, the economic reality for all citizens better. But it's a process. And we have to go through this process. We can't be saying that what we should do is get more for this and get more for that. You're going to hear 
you're going to hear the clowns who will say, oh, you have to do something about the prices. This is an open economy, meaning the government don't set the prices of commodities. The days of price control went out with Burnham. You can't dictate to someone what they will sell at. If they're going to sell bagan and, and, and bora and, and cabbage, you can't tell them what to sell for. Market forces will dictate that. Now, there were several things. There is more demand, so production or, or, or more people are going to be planting, and that's going to catch up. So that's one aspect of it. There, there's other things where we had floods, where we had some, there were difficulties with that. So people's crops are not, there was not as much crop coming to market. These are all reasons for that. But you can't dictate, a government can't say to a farmer, you can't sell your shallot at the price you want, and you can't sell your mangoes at the price you want. Those are driven by market forces. Inflation is worldwide because of, as I mentioned, the supply chain, the difficult inflation is worldwide. But at the same time, you know, comrades, what you're going to hear in the criticisms, but you've got to examine it for what it is. I don't want you to get sidetracked into all of the rhetoric kind of talk. The talk that will come from some quarters in the opposition, uh, there, there is an, an utter clown who has little or no capacity to reason, obviously, who keeps making posts about what are the prices of things in the, in the market and saying what the government should do about it. Now, I don't know how the government will dictate to the farmers the prices. That's just not going to happen. And the reality is the government has got to take what resources it has to try to alleviate that. So how do you alleviate that? You have the income tax threshold is raised, so you have a little bit more money in your pocket. You get an increase in the cash grants for your kids to go to school. The pensioners get a little bit more money. Now, we could all sit down and argue about how much is enough. And that would be a never-ending argument. Governments have to make responsible decisions. Decisions that are responsible enough for when the, the citizens' well-being are to improve. I mean, you can't be in government and make foolish decisions. I mean, you will hear criticisms, and you are hearing criticisms about the, the Demerara River Bridge. You're hearing all these criticisms by, in, in some quarters of the opposition, and you can expect it. You hear criticisms about uh, the gas to energy project, not realizing what the project will bring. And you hear all these complaints from one uh, opposition member in particular, about all these things about feasibility studies and feasibility studies. Now, we, they, it's easy to argue about this, right? But, but we, we have to remember what that particular, what APNU and that particular gentleman did in relation to feasibility studies. They spent all, more than $100 million, I believe it was, to do a, a feasibility study and came to the grand conclusion that the new bridge across the Demerara River should have three lanes. Three lanes. Now it's easy to figure out. One lane would go this way, one lane would go that way. What happens with that third lane? And they got a consultant for a hundred million dollars to say, and they believed it and tried to sell it to the Guyanese people that we do three lanes. Think of the logic about it. Everybody and every person knows you should have, you could have two lanes or you could have four. That means you would have two going. Or if you want six, 
Fine. But how would you have an odd number? This is the equivalent, right, of how you are either docile, foolish, or you get conned. This is, this is exactly what it would be. You actually paid a man to tell you three lanes is what your country needs. And that's you in government making a decision. That's what that APNU minister said. Now, think of the logic. This is the equivalent of knowing that when it is raining outside, this is the equivalent. And you need to go outside with an umbrella. You know that's what will protect you from the rain. And some fool tells you that if you go outside and wave your hands wildly, the rain wouldn't wet you. And you believe it. And you support that option to keep yourself dry. That is how stupid that was. But, comes back to, you do a feasibility study. So, you did a feasibility study, and an expert told you a three-lane highway, a three-lane bridge, and you being the clown that you are, you say, this is the way to go. Maybe it would have been better to tell the... the expert whoever he is that he could take his proposal and go wherever you're not interested because it makes no sense to do that but we have to see things always ladies and gentlemen for what they are you have to see things for what they are governments must make responsible decisions I'm not saying don't consult experts, but if you consult an expert who tells you nonsense, tell him it's trash and don't follow him. That's what you should do. But in the process and in the project that, that we as a people would want is we have to see we want in the project of Guyana, we have to see what we want. We want long-term benefits and comforts we want ease of travel these are things that we want and we also want we also want benefits now so it's a balancing act how much benefit can we actually get now and how much can we afford right now versus how much should we put towards the future knowing fully well that if we get the building blocks the fundamental right, the fundamentals right going forward, then we could fuel development in a much, much larger way. We know that that's possible. Now, again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to take into consideration too that when we, we have considerations in the budget about infrastructure in in many instances even in your your own personal lives these will be the big the so-called big ticket items and once you've spent on them you're not they're not going to be recurring expenses so when we spend uh, money on the, the bridge we're not going to have to spend that money again on the bridge. When we spend money on the power generation and the gas to energy project, we don't have to spend money on that again. Because once that capital expense is done, then all we do now is maintenance and all we do is manage, but we'll be getting income back from that. The power generation is going to be bringing back to the people, bringing back to the company, you pay for the use of the electricity. So you're going to hear, again, all the typical sorts of criticisms. And I want to tell you that it's so predictable that of what they're going to say. I mean, you're going to hear, and, and uh, Zulfi, Minister Zulfikar Mustafa is much more 
competent than I am at explaining the agricultural sector to you. And I'm sure you will hear in the coming weeks uh, during the budget debates about that. But I want to say to you this, that for example, Gaisuko, which, which people would like to quarrel and malign about, you have to see that the microeconomies that are created around uh, the sugar estates are actually the bloodline to those people. And it is easier for the government to build that industry and to try to make that industry more productive than it is to put all those people on the breadline. That's what David Granger's administration did. And look at what happened with those people. They couldn't send their children to school. There's still children in that area who, as a result of having missed those three years, those two, three years of school, they're struggling to get integrated back into the education system and we're doing everything we can because they're at various ages and they're, some of them are old, uh, much older than they would have been if they, uh, at the age at which you'd be at school. And you have to still get them, you have to still get a way to educate them. This is why there's more than a billion dollars for the Gold Scholarship Program and trying to get uh, education to people, trying to get edu scholarships to people so that they can uplift themselves. So that in the in the economies that we're going to have in Guyana, we're going to be able to have, you're going to be able to get a job. Um, vocational, carpentry, masonry, uh, Minister Hamilton is has revived the entire technical uh, training schools. And they are training people every day. And they're training more people who will have those unique set of skills that will earn them, get them to earn a living. So part of what you're doing is you got to understand you could spend on infrastructure, which is for the future, but you also got to train people. And you got to spend a lot of money to, to get those people trained and qualified and uh, I don't want to say capable because they're always capable, but, but qualify, meaning they can competently do the jobs that are on offer. With the, the, the petroleum sector, for example, there is a lot of need for persons who are um, of a particular, if they're welders, especially if they're carpenters, masons, they, all of those are, are in demand. And all of those are, are people that you could get jobs. Similarly, with the gold scholarship programs, there's so many courses that you can uplift yourself with so that you could get uh, uh, employed. These are all the things that are being provided for in the budget. Now, we have, ladies and gentlemen, to be patient. We have to be patient and not listen to the naysayers who will come only to criticize only to criticize, forgetting that when they closed Gaisuko, they put 7,000 people on the bread lines. Forgetting that they took away, they complain about a $25,000 or a $35,000 cash grant now, and that it's only a small increase. And they forgot, they think, they ignore that it was $10,000 when they went into government in 2015 and they scrapped it. They took it away from all the school children. They didn't say that, and at that stage it was only to the children who went to government schools. It wasn't for the private schools, it was only public schools. So again, they will come and criticize, why don't you give more? But they gave none, they took it all away. They raised taxes, 400 taxes. They forget these things. But in this budget now, what is it that we we have to be realistic? What is it what is this budget about? It's about being realistic. Don't listen to some clown is going to come and tell you that and I am sure you will hear someone coming in the coming week and speaking about the budget and talking about racism. And somehow or the other, make this 
budget about race. You're going to hear that too. You're going to hear that, but when you, you have to remember, look at the projects that are being done. Look at the projects that are done in Region 10, the housing that is going on, the housing development of house lots, the road to Linden, the road to Mabura, all of these are developments, the employment opportunities in those areas, the, the roads in those areas, what is going on. But as usual, because there is nothing else to say, and they, they will turn it into, you're going to hear it. I'm going to come next week, and I'm going to point out how many of them say that. And I'm going to point out to you next week when I come, and I'm going to tell you all the ones who will have nonsense to say about Guy Suko. Repeatedly, it's the same thing. They will forget that those people are people, their lives at stake, it's not a game. They will not want to admit that, that shrimping is doing better, and they will not want to admit that the efforts to improve that um, have been exceptional. They will not want to admit that um, the roads and the road network that is underway and the building of the roads has, is going to make transportation better. No, they will all come to say, well, oh, what you should do is you should do this and you should give more money here and give more money. Where's the money going to come from, ladies and gentlemen? We are a poor country. We have to be patient and we have to be humble about what is our position and where we're at. And it is now, with the proper management of our resources, with the proper and due effort into how we balance, that is going to advance us as a country. This is the truth. It might not be what people want to hear, but it's the truth. How are we going to advance ourselves if what we keep spending our money on has no long-term benefit? The typical thing that you say to people, you can't just, if you have a house and you want to build, you want to have a house and a car and to look after your family, you can't be sporting all the money out every weekend and you can't be spending all the money on food and clothes and partying, then you'll have no money to pay for the house. You'll have no money for the car. This is common sense. This is a debate that every citizen has. What can be spent? What can be afforded? This is the reality of life. So the Guyana government is, is simply doing that on a massive scale. There are thousands, literally thousands of projects on the way across Guyana. Thousands of projects. And those thousands of projects that are ongoing are, are long-term medium and long-term development. The roads are going to last for a while. The electricity is going to last for a while. The bridge is going to improve the lives of people over in Region 3 tremendously. So look at it holistically. Look at the opportunities that are there for you to get a job. Look at the opportunities for you to get, even if it's part-time employment, Look at the opportunities for you to get a scholarship from the goal uh, uh, facility. Pick, go on the website, sign up, look for the courses that you're interested. See if, if you go to the school and learn a trade from the vocational institutions and see if you get a training so that you could do better, you could do more. This is the reality of what it is that, that we are at the place. These are the crossroads that the country is at. This is where we're at. We're not going to be able, no matter what we do, no matter what we do, we are not going to be able to allocate all of our funds to immediate things now, which are not capital and infrastructure projects. And we also can't allocate all of it to capital and infrastructure projects only. Because if we did that, then this side would suffer. And if we did only 
this, then that side would suffer. It's the balancing act that has to take place. And that's what the budget is about. Don't listen to the usual nonsensical rhetoric. There was an, an, an absolute clown, or maybe he's a genius, we don't know, who says growth is not development or development is not growth. I mean, for, for a man to actually utter that and to actually say those words must be insane or borderline insane. You'll hear those that will come uh, the, in the opposition benches, especially the, the, the lawyers among them who will come with the grave, deep voices and say, well, oh, you know, this is, there are these grim tales that exist and there are these difficulties that will await us around the corner and that we haven't done this and we haven't done that, so fire and brimstone is going to come down on Guyana with all the seriousness that he can muster. But those same arguments he used, he's been using since 2018 in every court in this country, and he's lost every single case about the elections. And it's, it, it's so much more um, refreshing when those foolish arguments are made in a court and they're dealt with immediately and essentially they're disposed of. But in Parliament, I guess, you the people will have to decide how you want to dispose of those arguments. But don't be fooled. Don't get distracted by what it is. This is the budget that builds for the country and it has measures in it to alleviate some of the difficulties. Now, of course, everybody want, wish that it was possible to do more. But where's the money going to come from? We've got to meet our, our long-term projects so that development can move apace. When that happens, when that development comes true, that's what we all want for Guyana. And that's how it, that's how it is. That's what will be our position. So, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear so much more about the budget, about all the various aspects of the budget. I know that I didn't deal with too much of it in great detail because I thought it so important to try to explain as best that I can. I'm not an economist, as you well know. And I try to explain as best as I can the, the totality of what it is, the balancing act that is necessary the simple principles of money management and the decision-making process that must be responsible. That's what a government must do. Be responsible with the public funds. And that's what this budget is about. Now, as don't forget, we, we're going to hear the rhetoric I say about the racism, about the cussing of spending on money to help uh, the people and the employees of Gaisuko and to resuscitate that industry. You're going to hear um, all the talk that's, of course, been about grave things and all the, the absence of uh, feasibility studies. Then you're going to hear about the grave state of the country and all these things are going to happen, none of which are actually going to ever come to pass. But it's not going to stop those things from being said. It's not going to stop those things from happening. And by all means, Next week, Thursday, when we meet, I will point out whether those predictions are correct and I will, we will see whether that's all we get. But ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly for joining me tonight in your homes, wherever you are, looking at us on MTN television or on one of the Facebook plat uh, pages, the Facebook Live that's been shared. Thank you all for being here. I hope you have a good rest of the week. And as always, good night and may your God be with you.